your heart. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us cleanness. Give us pure heart. Let us not lift our souls to morning as we gather to worship, we want that to be our prayer. God, as we have known through the cross that we are forgiven when we don't deserve it, God, may us also be the people that who share the same love to our neighbors or whoever that may need your love, your revelation, your gospel truth. So God, would you teach us more and more as we join this time of sermon? Lord, would you use your servant, Pastor Stephen, so that whatever that God you put onto his mouth be solely your word, not a man's word. And let that truth be a living bread that we break together and edify and be one community under your name, Jesus, God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray.
Good morning, Promise Youth Ministry. Welcome back to another Sunday. We're continuing in our journey through the book of Galatians, and we're going to be examining Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14 today. So if you'll turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, and if you'll rise as we read the Word of God together this morning. The word of the Lord, it reads, Then Cephas came to Antioch. I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who belong to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line... With the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of all of them, You are a Jew, and yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When's the last fight that you had with somebody? Who was that with? I think for many of us, uh, we can get into a fight for a number of different reasons. Maybe you got into a fight with a sibling, a parent, a friend, or even a stranger on the street. We might fight because we have been offended and we want to reciprocate. Sometimes in our fights, we want the other person to feel as hurt as we feel. Perhaps some of our fights is because we have been falsely accused and so we are looking to defend ourselves. And maybe there's other times where we're just hurt, and so we're just lashing out. And I think that there are even probably more times where these fights, they just come from something petty, something small, something rather insignificant that just blew up and became rather bigger than it should have been. And I think we've all experienced a fight like this. And I think it's fair to say that all of us have fought someone because of something. But have you and I ever fought someone, got into into a disagreement or a conflict because of the gospel? Have we ever found ourselves in a position where we were defending not our hurt pride, not trying to protect some type of insult that protect ourselves from some insult that we've received, but we have moved to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth of the gospel, because it was being questioned. Because, brothers and sisters, as long as we are alive on this earth, there are going to be a number of things that we can fight over, both in the political sphere and in the personal sphere. We can fight over so many different things. But all of these fights, they tend to come down not about truth, but it's about preference. It's about what you prefer versus what the other person prefers. And think about the last fight that you had. What was it about? Was it about the truth Or was it about your truth, a subjective truth, or a preference that you have that differed from the other person? And I'm not saying all conflicts like that are bad, but there is an important fight that we are all called to be engaged in, and that is the fight for the truth of the gospel. And when we look at this text, we see here at what is called the incident at Antioch, That out of all the things that you and I could be fighting for, the gospel is the only one that is truly worth the fight. It's worth fighting for. And so for today, we're just going to talk about it in two parts. We're going to talk about the fight of fear and the fight for truth. So let's start with the first one, the fight for fear. You know, as we continue on in this COVID era, one thing that I truly, truly miss is eating with people. Um, obviously, I eat with my family at home, but let's, you know, they kind of get boring after a while. But no, and all, all uh, jokes aside, I just want to eat with people. I want to go to a restaurant and eat with those that I love, those that I want to share time with, those that I want to get to know. And I think for us, there is a cultural significance to eating, isn't there? If you ask someone on a date, what do you say? Do you want to grab a bite to eat? You eat with those that you care about, those that you want to catch up with. Eating is an important thing. I mean, especially in Korean culture. Where, I mean, what happens when there's mukjang? What do people bring over? They typically bring over food. Korean pear, maybe some type of a drink, maybe a, a bundle of rice, whatever it is. We, and even when someone is grieving, when someone is experiencing loss, we tend to bring over food. There's something important 
about it. I'm sure that there's many meals that you have eaten where they're just special to you. You remember them. Like on your birthday, maybe your mom asks you what you want to eat because it's a special day and that food is supposed to be special. You see, the early church, it was similar. They met together quite often in what was called table fellowship, the breaking of bread, the sharing of resources, the sharing of time, and the sharing of food. It was an important practice. But it wasn't always that way. Because when we look at the Old Testament and the law of God and Jewish law, there were specific laws about food, about who you could eat with and what you could eat. Then there was a long list of things. For example, there were not allowed to eat pork. Or my favorite eating law, you were not allowed to cook a baby goat in the milk of its mother, which seems kind of strange, right? And even the don't eat pork thing, I think for us as Koreans, it was like, it's like, well, what about tanggipsar? It's so good. But we got to keep in mind the context here. You see, the Israelites, they were surrounded by Gentiles who worshipped pagan gods, false gods. And God wanted Israel to be distinguished from all of the other nations. He wanted them to be different. Why? Because all these other nations, they worship false gods. But God is saying to Israel, you worship the one true God, and so you will act differently so that when other people look at you they will be confused to the point where they will become curious that they will know me because of you he's essentially saying you can't claim to be my people and look and act and behave like everyone else around you and for God these laws they weren't just about rituals but they were about obedience he wanted his people to have a heart that desire to obey him because of his great love for them but then all of a sudden we get to Jesus and we see that our Lord Jesus abided by the law perfectly and he fulfilled the law perfectly and in doing so he changed everything and that actually included what we could eat and what we could not eat. You see, in Acts chapter 10, Peter has this vision. And in this vision, the Lord presents to him all of these foods that were deemed to be unclean by the law. And the Lord says to Peter, eat. And Peter's like, whoa, no, these are unclean. I think if I was Peter, I'd be like, wait, are you testing me again? Just like the time I denied you, I, I, I repented of that. I, I'm not going to do it again. And so Peter's like, no, no, no. I've never eaten this unclean food. I'm not going to eat it. And Jesus says to him, I'm telling you that this food is now clean. Don't call it unclean because I am calling it clean. And this is a huge deal because for centuries, the Jews have abided by a strict diet according to the law. It's been a cultural marker for them. But here Jesus is saying the only cultural marker is me. And I think we can relate that to the culture that you and I live in. For example, Korean culture. There are certain marks of Korean culture, aren't there? Even in food. For example, like Korean foods, they're all kind of like stews at the end of the day, right? You're taking something, you're boiling it over like 15 hours, or you're taking something and you're burying it on the ground for 15 hours and you're bringing it back up. And I think one of the foods that's most symbolic of Korean culture is probably kimchi. We make stew out of it, we add it to meat, we eat it on its own. And sometimes if you're like, if your taste buds are really Korean, like you crave kimchi at like weird times. Like, for example, my family, when we eat steak, even if it's nice steak, we crave kimchi. Or maybe you're eating pizza. Sometimes when I'm just eating Papa John's pizza, I crave kimchi because it's like this cultural marker. It's a part of who I am. It's a part of who my family is. But here Jesus is saying, these dietary laws are not a cultural marker. They don't define who you are. They're not a part of it. Only I am. And so Peter receives this vision. And all of a sudden, if you are a believer, even though you're a Jew, but you're a Christian now, you can eat these foods. And so we get to the setting for today. And that is the church of Antioch. And Antioch was a Gentile church primarily. 
And Peter is there. And because of this vision that he has received, he starts eating, having table fellowship with the Gentiles. And this is a huge deal. Peter is one of the, he's, he's a Jew by birth his whole life. And all of a sudden, he's doing something that the Jews have not done for centuries. This is like those movies where you see that popular kid sit down and eat lunch with the outcasted kid. This is like, Jesus when he ate with the tax collectors. You ever wonder why the, fel- the Pharisees were so offended when Jesus dined with the tax collectors? That's because who you ate with was a symbol of who you had fellowship with, who you were sharing life with. It was a big deal. And we see that by Peter eating with the Gentiles, his understanding of the gospel wasn't just head knowledge. It wasn't even, but it was his heart that was transforming his actions. The gospel was changing the way he conducted himself. But here we have a problem. You see, disciples of James come into town. And when Peter sees them, they're Jews, he leaves the Gentiles behind and he starts to eat with the Jews, fearing that people will find out that Peter, a prominent Jew, was dining with Gentiles. What's the problem here? All of a sudden, Peter is no longer living in line with the gospel. He isn't operating out of truth. In fact, Peter is operating out of fear. In the fight, fear is winning. Because this is Peter. Peter who walked with Jesus. Peter who witnessed the ministry of Jesus. Peter who saw the resurrected Lord. The Peter who received a vision from the resurrected Lord in Acts chapter 10. But all of a sudden, this Peter who knows the gospel. When push comes to shove, he doesn't fight for the gospel. Instead, he resorts to operating out of fear. Peter isn't being consistent with what he believes and what he knows to be true. In this moment, he is not fighting for the truth, but he is fighting on the side of cowardice and fear. And this is a choice that is presented to us, brothers and sisters, in a number of different ways in our life. And these, the way they reveal themselves, it, it reveals our base of operations, For example, do we fear people, the approval of people, more than we fear the approval of God? Are we more afraid of the disapproval of people than the disapproval of God? In your day-to-day actions, do you find yourself in a situation where God wants you to do one thing, but because you are afraid of people, you don't do it? Do you have a moment of conviction where God is telling you, let go of this sin. I don't want it to chain you and enslave you anymore. But because everyone else around you is doing it, you find yourself committing to it again and again. I was talking with a brother recently who was who's struggling with a very specific type of sin. And the sin tends to come up when he's around a certain group of people. And I told him very honestly and straightforward, I said, you need to stop hanging out with those people. And this person said, why? I don't want to be mean. I don't want to cut them out of my life and for them to think less of me. But you see what he's done there. You've placed the approval of man greater than the approval of God. What people will think of me as more important than what God thinks of me. Perhaps for some of us, we operate out of a fear of rejection, that we don't want to fully commit to obeying God, to living out our life as believers, because we're afraid that we will be rejected by people. Maybe it's the popular people, the cool people, the people that we want their approval. And that's what Peter is doing here. And that's a situation that we find ourselves in time and time again. But you see, brothers and sisters, if you know the gospel and you know that your approval and standing has been given to you by Christ, by the creator of the universe, once again, the heavyweight champion of the world, the all pro, all time greatest, then what does the approval of man matter? 
Because the approval of man will come and go. It will fade. What is popular, what is trending, it will pass. But our God does not. He is eternal and everlasting. And he doesn't want us to operate on a worldly fear. He doesn't want us to seek the approval of man because he knows that there is no fruit there. And I think deep down, if we really break it down, we understand that that's to be true. Because can you think about your life if all you cared was the opinion of others? And some of you are in that position where most of your life has been motivated by the opinion of others. You know what that's like. It's exhausting. Because it's something that can never be satisfied and never be quenched. But God says, you can find my approval and what my son has done for you. And I want you to rest in that. I want you to operate out of a reverence for me rather than a fear of people so that you have a heart that desires to obey me instead of being enslaved by what people think about you. Because, brothers and sisters, when we operate out of fear, more often than not, you know what we become? We become hypocrites. You know, unfortunately, in our modern culture, that word has become synonymous with Christians, that all Christians are hypocrites. But brothers and sisters, if you are a true Christian, you know that you have been saved by grace alone, no merit of your own, and that, yes, you will fail, but God's grace is there. And so you don't boast in what you're capable of, but you boast in who Christ is. But a hypocrite, a hypocrite is one who doesn't practice what they preach. They don't live out the gospel like this. They may tell people one thing and, and act like they do it when the reality is that they don't. In other words, it's what happens when we say we are one thing, but we act like another. And far too often we find ourselves in that situation where we are spiritually inconsistent. We have spiritual schizophrenia where we have multiple personalities depending on the context that we are in and the people that we are surrounded by. And brothers and sisters, that is hypocr hypocritical. If who you are to God in your quiet time is different than when you're in other settings, that's hypocritical. If our bodies do not follow what our hearts confess, that is hypocritical. If we're following certain people on Instagram and, and following certain trends on the internet that aren't in line with our confession that we are believers, then we've fallen into hypocrisy. Because brothers and sisters, how many of us have found ourselves in a situation where we have had a radical experience with the living God? But we still find ourselves living like the world, talking like the world, thinking like the world, and desiring the things of this world. How many times have we found ourselves in that position? You know, so often I hear someone say, I don't feel close to God anymore. Well, maybe it's because you aren't doing things and acting like someone who is close to God. The distance isn't that God is distant. The distance is that our actions are very distant and therefore inconsistent with someone who claims to be a believer. And there's this quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer that I love. He says this, Your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. I say that one more time. Your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. And brothers and sisters, is that us? When people look at us, do they say, man, I need to be on what he's about. I need to get with the program that she's on. Clearly, they know something that I do not. Or just do we look like everyone else around us? And that's the situation that Peter finds himself in. That even though he knows the gospel in this moment, he looks like everyone else. He looks like those of the circumcision party who do not believe the gospel of grace. But brothers and sisters, let that not be us. Let us be consistent in our private fellowship with the Lord and in our public fellowship with him. Spiritual consistency, brothers, be who you say you are. Or perhaps in the light of the gospel, I should say, be who God says you are because you have received his son. And when you start to do that, you won't have to fight out of the fear of what people will think about you. But all of a sudden, you could be a person that fights for the truth. You see, Paul comes in 
and he sees Peter and what Peter's been doing, and he calls him out. You know, I don't know how many of you are confrontational people. For some of you, confrontation is a nightmare that you have once in a while when you're going to sleep because you hate confrontation. You hate conflict. And yet some of you, you love confrontation. You love calling people out and you just love, you just like say it how it is. Well, here we have Paul calling out Peter. And he does it publicly, which some of us might be like, dude, what the heck? Like, why are you calling out Peter publicly? And the reason is, Peter's a leader in the church. He has influence, but he has done something that will shake and stumble those around him. And so it has to be addressed publicly. But you see, Paul, when he's calling out Peter, see, sometimes for us, when we're feeling confrontational, we call someone out, it's because we want to bring them down. We want to make them lower. But that's not Paul's heart here, because if that was Paul's heart, he wouldn't be fighting for the truth. He'd be fighting for himself to show himself as a certain light or in a certain manner. But you see, Paul, look at what Paul says here. He's not slamming Peter's character. He's not even bringing up past dirt. Paul doesn't go to Peter and say, hey, first you deny Jesus three times, and now you're not going to eat with the Gentiles? Where does it stop with you? No, Paul is not after Peter's character. You know, oftentimes this is how we fight. We degrade others in an order to elevate ourselves. We want to make people feel worse so we can feel better. But you see, once again, this is a fear-driven fight. It's a fear-driven fight because we don't want people to think less of us. We want people to think more of us. But for Paul, this fight is not about fear. It's not about the approval of man. He, he doesn't care what anyone thinks about him. Peter, or Paul, is fighting for the truth of the gospel. He's defending the gospel. And out of a desire to not see it get corrupted, he speaks out boldly and confidently. Why? Because Paul's heart is about the truth. You see, Peter, by leaving the Gentiles and once again eating with the Jews, he's essentially saying, yeah, they're right. The Jews are better. They are more saved. That Jesus isn't enough. You also need to follow these laws. But Paul looks at that and says, no way. We're all equal before God. Be consistent. And we still do this to this day, right? We mentioned it briefly last week, the divisions in Christianity, those who serve versus those who don't, those who commit worse sins versus those who do not. But brothers and sisters, if we're fighting for the truth, then this means that when we see people not acting in line with the truth, when we see even cliques forming that aren't in line with the truth, then these are things that must be addressed. And even the way we see people must be in line with the truth of the gospel. And I think what Paul does here begs the question for us of do we fight for this truth? You know, for some of us, we're like Peter. Our sin has made that sin acceptable to those around us. For some of us, we're like Peter in the sense that the fact that we do it makes it okay for other people to do it. And do you see that in doing so, you are not fighting for truth. You are not fighting for the truth of the gospel. You're not standing in line with the gospel. And for many of us, when we find, when we're called out on that, we're like, well, I'm just going to hide doing it. But again, that's not a heart that's been bought and sold by the gospel. That's a heart that has still fear over what people think. You're not fighting for the truth you're fighting for yourself. It is cowardly self-preservation. But we see Paul here who wants to fight for the truth. And that's the fight that you and I need to have one, with one another. And what does that mean? What does that look like? I want to propose a few things. Brothers and sisters, do you know someone who is spiritually struggling in your life? When's the last time you fought for them? When's the last time that you... You sought them out to address what was happening in your life. Brothers and sisters, do you know someone in your life who is caught in a vicious cycle of unrepentant sin? Are you willing to address it with them? Are you willing to be confrontational in the name of the truth of the gospel? Brothers and sisters, do we fight for the truth? When you see someone living a lie, 
Do you move to correct it? Or do you just ignore it? Brothers and sisters, think about the many fights that you and I have gotten into. I think so for so many of the fights that we've had, it kind of ends with, that probably wasn't worth it. Brothers and sisters, this is a fight that worth, that's worth having. Brothers and sisters, how many of us, when we see something on social media that is clearly not in line with the gospel of Jesus Christ, how many of us either like it or ignore it, but how many of us will actually stand up against it? so that other people don't get bought in by the lies of this world and the trends and the fads of this world. Brothers and sisters, this is the fight that we that is worth having. I think for many of us, we've been out of the game for too long, and we, gotta, we need to get back in. And so there's two things that I propose that we do this week. The first is, unlike Peter, let's walk in accordance to the gospel. And For some of you, you know exactly what that means. It means that there is something in your life that you have been holding on to that it is time to cut out because it is inconsistent with who you confess and profess to be, a believer of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, let us walk the walk. Let us live in accordance to what we believe. Let's be consistent believers this week. But the second is, when we see those who are denying the gospel, whether they are friends or strangers, let us stand in opposition, not to bring them down, but for the truth to be made known so that the truth would bring people in. This is the fight of the gospel that every believer is called to be engaged in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your word because it is is truth. It is a truth that we must be holding on to, a truth that we must be living for, abiding for, but Lord, also fighting for. And so I pray that you would get us off the bench but and we would start to be people who live and practice what we believe and what we confess and that we would fight for the gospel when it is being slandered, shamed, and forgotten, that we would be vigilant, Lord, defenders of your truth. So I thank you, and in Jesus' name I pray, amen.